right, so good morning, everybody. Good morning, local people. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, thank you. Good morning, people out there in the ether. And you don't have to say good morning. That would be too much work for you. Okay, so my name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I lead the user engagement group here at NERSC. So if you're a NERSC user, I assume you all are, you get an email from me every Monday. That's like my claim to fame. Like when I go to conferences, I'm walking, I have like my name tag and people are like, I know you, you send me an email every Monday. Yes, I do, yes. Okay, um, so in my presentation, I'm gonna give you an introduction to NERSC. Um, we're going to talk about the hardware that we have here at NERSC, uh, the software that we have, and then we're going to talk about interacting with NERSC, how you can interact with us, and then some information about user responsibilities and expectations. Okay, so NERSC stands for National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. So that's why we call ourselves NERSC. Okay. Uh, so we were established in 1974 as the first unclassified supercomputer center. Our original mission was fairly specific. So we were originally created to enable computational science as a complement to magnetically controlled plasma experiments. Um, so today our mission has really branched out from that. So today we are here to accelerate scientific discovery at the DOE Office of Science through high performance computing and extreme data analysis. So NERSC is a national user facility, so that means we have users from all over the country. We're open to anyone in the country, and actually we have a number of users internationally as well. So we have about 7,000 users as of last year, uh, and we have 800-ish projects. Um, and these 7,000 users in 800 projects use more than 600 codes. We have hundreds of users who are active every day. Um, our allocations of time on these machines and resources is primarily controlled by the Department of Energy itself. So 80% of our time goes towards the DOE Annual Production Awards, which is called ERCAP, which stands for Energy research computing allocations program. So that's way too long, that's why we call it ORCAP. Um, so people can get anywhere from 10,000 to 10 million hours, sometimes even 100 million hours on our machines that they can use for a full year. Uh, so this is a proposal-based system and the successful awardees are chosen by DOE allocation program managers. So um, an additional 10% is given by the DOE Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge. So this is for more sort of high risk but potentially high payback sort of projects. And then 10% um, is our reserve for NERSC. So we do stuff with it. We, we have like strategic projects. We have overhead for when we're doing trainings or something like that. Um, so that's that's kind of how the breakdown goes here. So now, like I said, the Department of Energy is the ones who decide mostly what gets on NERSC supercomputers. So it's specifically, it's in the Office of Science. So there's a couple of different offices within DOE. Um, one of them is the National Nuclear Security Administration. So they do, they do like um, um, our nuclear arsenal stewardship, stockpile stewardship is what it's called. Um, but then the Office of Science is really interested in, in fundamental science research. And in fact, they're the number one funder of physical science research in the United States. Uh, so there are six offices, um, plus the Small Businesses Innovation Research Office. So these six offices, each they each get kind of like a portion of nurse time to give to their users or to whoever they want to give it to. So this is kind of the breakdown you can see in this pie chart, the breakdown of the types of science that gets done at NERSC and how much of the allocations that they get. 
Okay, so I mentioned before that we have over 600 codes running at NERSC. It's probably a higher number by now. But you can see in this breakdown, we have this breakdown of what codes are running at NERSC. Um, so 600 sounds pretty overwhelming, but honestly, there's about 10 codes that make up close to 50% of our workload. And then there's 15 more, so a total of 25, that make up about two thirds of our workload. So then there's just a bunch of other ones that people are running. So NERSC has a huge focus on science. So our users, they publish more than any other center in the world, as far as we know. Um, we have about 2,500 publications per year. Um, so in 2018, we had 14 publications just in nature, 31 in nature communications, um, 11 in science. And you know, these single word journals are like the most prestigious ones, right? So that's pretty amazing. Um, we also have six Nobel Prize winning users, and so we're really proud of that. So something, something that um, you should understand is that, uh, you know, we're funded by the United States government, right? And so if nobody ever tells the United States government how great we are, right, then they'll stop funding us, right? If, if nobody tells them, oh, we really used NERSC and it was really invaluable to our research, then maybe they won't fund us anymore. And that would be bad. I would be sad. I would be unemployed. And then you all would be sad, too, because you wouldn't have a computer to use. So be sure to acknowledge NERSC in your publications, because that way, then we can say, look, look at these great publications, this great science that's coming out of NERSC, right? So we have a little blurb that we like you to put in there that says, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to read it to you because you all can read, but it's available on our website. So you just want to put that in your research paper, like in the acknowledgments section. And then if you have some super cool science that you did with NERSC, send them to us. Let us know because we love to publicize the stuff that our users do because most of us are working here because of the science. You know, we're not, believe it or not, we're not working here for the big bucks. I know that's incredible. Um, you can, we could make a lot more if we just went to work at Google or Facebook or something. But we're working here because we really care about the mission. We really love science. So that's why we're here. OK. So let's talk a little bit about our systems. So back in 2013, we got this super great system called Edison. Some of you may be familiar with that system. Um, we recently retired it. In 2016, we got Cori. Um, and, and then um, at the end of 2020, we're going to get Perlmutter. So in case you didn't notice, we name our machines after great scientists, so Edison. Cori is named after Gertie Cori, who was the first woman to get, first American woman to earn a um, Nobel Prize in science. Um, and she discovered the Cori cycle, which is some kind of metabolic cycle in the cell. And I've told you everything I know about that. Okay, so that we're going to get Perlmutter at the very end of 2020. It'll be available to users in 2021. And then hopefully in 2024, we'll get a new machine, NERSC 10. We have no idea what that's going to be like, we're, but we're already planning for it. Okay, so Cori uh, is a really great machine, but we're really looking forward to Perlmutter, which is the ninth machine that we've had. That's why it's called NERSC 9. Um, so it's going to be a Cray Shasta system, and it's going to be three to four times more powerful than Cori. Um, and this is the first system that we've ever had that we've really designed it to meet the needs of simulation and data analysis from experimental facilities. So both of these things combined into one machine. Um, so uh, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, uh, you know, because when you buy a Cray, you basically you buy it so that you can get the mural on the front. I'm just joking about that. But you do get a cool mural on the front when you pay lots of money for a supercomputer. Um, so this is just kind of an example of what it could look like, but that's probably not what the machine's going to end up looking like, just so you know. Okay, so you may wonder why we're calling it Perlmutter. It seems like a really long name. 
Um, so Saul Perlmutter was the winner of the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, he discovered the accelerating expansion of the universe. Um, and when he was working on this research, he was really a pioneer in using supercomputers, combining large-scale simulations with experimental data analysis. So uh, Saul Perlmutter is actually still alive, um, and he works at Berkeley Lab. And <clears throat> so we had to ask his permission if we could name the machine after him. And he said yes, but on the condition that we, when people SSH into it, they just can SSH into sol.nurse.gov because Perlmutter was too long. <laughs> so I guess what this means is that no one will ever name a machine after me. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the systems that we have here at NERSC. Okay, so um, until last month, in fact, just over a month ago, we had Edison, but Edison has now been decommissioned, so that's why he has that that said no, no, no sign, as my son calls it. Um, but we still have Cori. So Cori is a Cray XC40 machine. Um, it has about 2,400 nodes with Haswell cores in those. So those are just kind of standard CPU cores that everyone is used to. Uh, and then it has almost 10,000 nodes with uh, Intel KNL Xeon Phi cores. And so what these are, these are many core processors. Um, they're low energy, but actually very powerful in the aggregate. Uh, so Cori also has a unique feature called the data warp. You might have heard of that as burst buffer, right? Um, and so the burst buffer is an all-flash, very fast, very powerful file system. And so in fact, I believe you're going to learn more about that later on today. Okay. Um, and then we have a lot of other... Uh, Things. We've got a scratch system that is attached to Cori. It's a scratch file system, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a few minutes. We've got our project file system. We've got our home file system, and we've got HPSS, which is like a, a long-term storage system. And then we're all connected to all these internet, uh, to the internet and through ESNet, which is a, uh, the Energy Sciences Network, which is a really powerful network that serves um, science um, in the United States. Okay, so let's talk about Cori a little bit more. So I mentioned we've got these Haswell nodes, right? So we've got about 2,500 of those or so. Um, and then we've got these KNL nodes. So these Haswell nodes, so when we were designing this machine, we wanted to have sort of something that people could use really well for like processing their data. Okay, so that's why we have these Haswell nodes. So they're really good for throughput of, of data. That's kind of like what we're trying to do. Uh, the queues on this allow, actually, you can just run a single core job. You don't have to run a multi multiple node job if you don't want to. Um, and there's kind of longer wall time limits for smaller jobs. Now, one drawback it, to this part of the machine is that it is so popular that it has very long queues. So you'll have a very long wait time <coughs> Excuse me. Very long wait time if you want to use those nodes. Now, on the other hand, we've got the KNL nodes. So these are really good. Like I said, they're really good for performance. They're very low power, but they have and they have like a whole bunch of cores on them. But that, if you can exploit that kind of an architecture, you can have really good performance on these nodes. Uh, we really like large jobs on on the. KNL partition of the machine. Um, if you run a job that ha uses at least 1,024 nodes, you even get a discount. Now, isn't that great? Okay. Um, it's like four times as big as the Haswell side of, of the machine. So this is really the best place to run your jobs if you can at all use it. Um, it has much shorter queues. And then we have something unique called the flex queue, which I believe we'll talk about later in, an, in a later presentation. But the idea with the flex queue is that you can, you can be flexible with how long your job runs. And if you can do that, you can get an even bigger discount too. Okay. Okay, so let's talk more, let's talk about our file systems. So I mentioned we've got home, project, scratch, we've got the burst buffer, we've got HPSS. 
So home is your home directory. That's where your home directory is at NERSC. Um, it's kind of small. We keep it small on purpose because the purpose of this is for you to kind of store some data like your source code or your shell scripts or something. But we don't, we don't mean for you to run jobs out of it. And in fact, if you try to run jobs out of it, it's not really tuned to perform well for parallel jobs. So you're going to get bad performance on your jobs. Uh, you have a 40 gig uh, quota, and we can't change that. It's a 40 gig quota, the end. Um, <coughs> it has this snapshot backup system on it. So if you're in your home directory and you accidentally deleted a file and you're like, oh no, I deleted the file, never fear. There's a snapshot backup that you can access. OK, <coughs> excuse me. Project is the next file system. So project is a permanent larger storage. It's also mounted on all of the platforms. It has medium performance on parallel jobs. It's pretty good. Um, we can increase your quota on project. Um, and it also has this snapshotting feature. And project is really the perfect system for if you're sharing data within your research group, right? So within your project, you put your data on project, and then everybody else in your project can access that data. OK, now we talk about some local file systems. So we've got Scratch and Burst Buffer. So Scratch is a large temporary storage system. And it's really optimized for read-write sort of operations, but not really for storage. Um, it's not backed up. This is very important. If you have your data on Scratch and it goes away, too bad, so sad. It's not backed up. Um, we also have a purge policy. So if you have a file that is not accessed in the past 12 weeks, then we reserve the right to delete that file. So this is a perfect system for staging your data in and performing computations. So that's what, that's what we aim to have people do with the Scratch file system, is stage your data, perform your work, and then get it off after you're done. OK, so on Cori, we have the burst buffer. Um, and it is sort of a temporary per job storage system. So it's a high performance SSD file system. So, um, it, so most file systems are, are spinning disk. But this one is solid state drives. So that's why it performs so much better. Um, it's available only on Cori. Um, and this is really great file system if you are trying to run your stuff and you find that on Scratch that you're getting bad performance because your code is constrained by the I.O. operations. So if you have an I.O. intensive application, then you should consider using the burst buffer. OK, now we're going to talk about HPSS, which is a long-term storage system. So HPSS stands for High Performance Storage System. Um, and it's an archive. Okay, So what you do is you take any data that, is not, that you're not going to access every day, but you still want to save it, and you put it into HPSS. It's a hierarchical storage system. And actually, it's really fascinating how this works. So it, at the very front, uh, you know, kind of the front line of the machine, it has uh, uh, some disk arrays, just like spinning disk, just like regular what you would expect. And then in the back end, it has a tape subsystem. And that is where your data kind of migrates to. So when you first put your data on there, it's in this front system, this, these spinning disks, or if you've recently accessed that data. But then it gets migrated to the back into these tapes. Um, and so you'll get to learn more about HPSS in later presentations, but I just kind of wanted to give you a feel for, for what that was like. OK, so let's talk about using NERSC file systems. So kind of like file system etiquette, OK? So this is an imperfect analogy, but I think it gets my point apart, uh, across. So let's say that computing is like baking, OK? And your input is like your baking ingredients. And your output is a cake. Right? Now, who doesn't love cake? I don't know. So basically, in this scenario, NERSC is like a gigantic shared kitchen space with all the latest gadgets. Okay? Uh, so you can think of the, 
the computers as being like the oven, right? Like when you're doing your computations, that's when you're baking your cake and you're getting your output of cake. Home and project are kind of like your pantry or your fridge, okay? Um, it's where you kind of keep your ingredients. HPSS is like the freezer where you keep, you know, the frozen blueberries or things that you don't access very often, but sometimes you might need them. And then scratch is like your kitchen countertop, okay? So nobody's, nobody's looking at me with great disdain, but probably people think I'm nuts so far. Okay, so anybody, anybody do baking or anything? Anybody, anybody like to do that? Okay, it's in my name, so I love it. Um, so when, when you bake, first thing you want to do is you want to stage all of your ingredients, right? You want to put them all on your kitchen countertop. Make sure they're all there. Right? Has anybody ever not done that? And then you're like, oh crap, I don't have any baking powder or whatever. And then you have to go to the store and you have to buy it, right? So that's a mess. So you want to put them all in there and you want to put them on your kitchen counter. So likewise, when we're doing computation, it's the same idea, right? We're staging our input data and our executable onto the Scratch file system, okay? Now, after you're baking, you got to clean up after yourself, right? Um, so, you remember, this is like a shared kitchen space. So, like, that would be super rude if you just left all your, dirt, you know, your dirty dishes and your rotting eggshells and stuff all over the counter, right? Super rude. So, it's okay if you just kind of let your cake cool there for a while, but you got to get it all off and you got to clean up after yourself, because. If you, if you don't clean up after yourself, then we will. And it won't be in a way that you like. So, you know, at, you know maybe if you're at home and you left all of your dirty dishes out, maybe, maybe your mom would come by because she needed to use the kitchen too and she would, uh, you know, get rid of the eggshells and clean up all your bowls and stuff. But no, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to throw everything out. We're going to put it all in the trash, including your cake. Okay, so that's the analogy. That's why we have this purge thing. After 12 weeks, we're going to get rid of it. We're going to throw away everything, even your cake. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. So, how about the space for the HPSS? It's like the unlimited So, yeah, that's a good question. So, the HPSS space, is it unlimited? Um, it is limited but it's not very limited. So, so yes, you could take, you, what, ideally what you should do is you should take your cake or your results and you should put it into HPSS or, any, or some kind of long-term storage like that. But try not to clean up your eggshells and put them in there too, because that'd be gross. Okay, good. Yeah? Are there nodes with local FSD scratch or local nodes? No. No, there are not nodes with local SSD scratch, <laughs> right? So it's a global scratch file system, um, and it's it's a completely like separate set of cabinets where the file system is located, and then the burst buffer is located on. There are some burst buffer nodes that are within the machine, so that's where the SSDs are, but they're not local to any given node. Have we ever had time when the network was limiting the I.O.? Definitely. So if you run like super I.O. intense jobs? So, um, so this is a complicated question. Um, we have had times when we've had network issues that have impacted it. However, the Cray Ares network, which is what is behind the scenes on these machines, um, has sort of like this um, adaptive routing that it can do. So uh, generally, like if, if, if there's a link down or something, it'll just kind of route around that. So the, the problems, of course, would come if we had so many links down that it couldn't route around it, right? Like if there really literally was no path from A to B, that could be a problem. Uh, but we have, we, you know, we, we maintain the machine, we try to take good care of it, and so we've, we've never really had anything like that happen. And if it were to happen, then that would be an outage of the machine, it just would not be working. We would consider it an outage. 
Okay. Um, so let me talk about software now. So uh, the Cray supercomputers, they run uh, an OS that is a version of Linux. Okay. It's a little bit optimized for the, for the platform, but it's basically it's Linux. Uh, we provide compilers on the machines. Um, and we have a lot of libraries that you might need to use in your, in your compiling your code. So um, we have some that are provided by the vendor and then still others that we provide from NERSC. Um, and then also we compile and support many software packages for our users, particularly in the computational chemistry and materials science area. Um, and we'll, you'll see more details in later presentations. So I just wanted to show you though, these are like all, a whole bunch of chemistry and materials applications that we provide. Okay, so let's talk about interacting with NERSC. So first we're gonna talk about consulting our operations group and then we'll talk about the NERSC user group. Okay, so look at all these beautiful faces here. This is the consulting team. So whenever you send in a ticket or you, uh, you make a phone call, you're going to reach one of these fantastic folks. Um, so we are the first line of people who you interact with when you submit a ticket or you call. Um, and in 2018, we actually handled 7,194 tickets from 2,350 unique users. Okay. Now, sometimes when you send in a ticket, um, we don't know how to handle it, so we'll pass it on to somebody else. But those pictures are of the people who take the tickets and figure out what to do with them. Okay, so we have some service level agreements. So we will reply to you within four business hours. Okay, so business hour is uh, eight to five, Monday through Friday. Okay, so if you, if you send in a ticket at 5.01 p.m. today, you won't get a reply until Monday. Okay, so just know that. Um, we will help you resolve your problem and keep you apprised of the progress. Um, we will attempt to accommodate any needs that don't fit within our operating structure. Okay, so we have, you know, we have rules, we have, we have the way that we do things for a reason that, and it works for most people, but if it doesn't work for you, then you know you can send in a ticket and we can talk about it and we can figure out how we can best accommodate you. And of course, we always welcome user feedback and constructive criticism. Okay, so a few tips and tricks here. Help us to help you. Okay, so if you, if you send in a ticket that says, my code doesn't work, okay, that's not very helpful to us, <laughs> right? We don't know what code, uh, we don't know what machine you're on, what did you do, um, why is it not working, like is it, it worked yesterday and now it doesn't work today, or is it that it's never worked, or, and what is it that isn't working, are you able to compile it, are you able to submit a job to run it, you know, what's, like, what's going on. So the, the more specifics that you can provide, the better, because the better we can help you. Because amazingly, none of us are mind readers. I've been trying for a long time, but it doesn't work. Okay, so we have a whole staff of operations staff, and they are on site 24-7, 365 and a quarter days per year uh, to supervise the operation of the machine room. So if you have a problem at 2.05 a.m. on Christmas morning, there's somebody here who, who can help. Now, what they do is they, they primarily supervise the operation of the machines to make sure that, you know, everything's running smoothly. So they can't help you compile your code, but if the machine is down or if there's a problem, they know about it and they can tell you. So you can, you can give them a call because they're always there. You can give them a call and find out what's going on. And they can do some simple tasks that you know, that are within their domain of expertise. So they can help you reset your password. Um, they can kill your jobs for you if you need your job to be killed. Um, they can make a few changes to a reservation that is still running. But they are a really great resource and some really amazing people who work down there. 
And I say down because they're directly below us. Okay, so then we've got the NERSC user group. So the NERSC user group, we call it NUG. It's, a, it's our NERSC user community. Um, so it's a really great source of advice and feedback for NERSC. So we like, we like feedback. We like to know what users are thinking and what they want so that we can do better for them and do what they need. Um, it, so there's an executive committee, which is uh, three representatives from each office in the Office of Science. So you remember I had that list of offices in the Office of Science. So there's three representatives from each of those. And then there's three members at large. And also we generally have monthly teleconferences hosted by NERSC, usually on the third Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. So you can feel free to tune into those. And then also we have our NERSC user group annual meeting, which is going to happen next month on Friday, July 19th in Maryland, somewhere in Maryland, <laughs> in the D.C. area. So you can find all of that on our website as well. Okay, so you're a NERSC user, really happy that you are. I just want to give you some ideas of our responsibilities and expectations. So the first thing is be kind to your neighbor users. So don't abuse the shared resources. So in particular, the login nodes are a shared resource. So if you're doing something that's really compute intensive on the login node, then you're ruining the experience of the other people on that login node because then they can't get anything done. Okay. Um, another one is to use your allocation smartly. So when your allocation is gone, there's not a lot that we can do to give you more allocation. So if you, if you squandered your allocation on something, you know, it's, it's kind of too bad. We're really sorry, but that's about it for us. Um, so another thing is to pick the right resource for your job and your data. So if you're running some small jobs, that's really great on the Corey Haswell nodes, but probably not so great on the KNL nodes. Like if you want to just run on a single core, probably the KNL nodes is not the place for you to do that. Um, back up your stuff, especially from Scratch, because Scratch has a purge policy, and so we're going to throw it all away. We're going to throw away your cake, okay? If there's anything, if there's any like take home message today that you understand is that NERSC is going to throw away your cake, okay? Um, acknowledge us in your papers so that we can stay in business. And pay attention to security. So don't, don't share your account with other people. Please don't do that, because then we have to disable your account. All right, well, so I just want to say finally thank you and welcome to NERSC. All right.